welcome to our live virtual tasting series. Tonight is uh, session seven, and we're going to be looking at uh, a taste, a guided tasting of our 2017 Unsanctioned Series Pinot Noir. And uh, to help us through this process, I thought we could maybe talk a little bit about um, wine aromas and how to train your nose to detect them. Um, before we get started, quick update, uh, the vineyard. We're getting close to being completely ready for spring. Um, we've had uh, a lot of late nights over the last week or so. Uh, Michelle and I have been out in the vineyard um, most nights. We take a couple nights off every once in a while, but uh, most nights we've been out there um, looking for cutworms, and if we find them, we squish them. These are the little, uh, little critters that crawl up the vines and eat the buds and the freshly uh, burst uh, shoots. And uh, that's uh, no good for our grapes, so we have to take care of them. <laughs> that's what we've been doing. Um, hopefully, in the next uh, within the next week or so, we'll be done. Um, our vineyard is uh, is now in the midst of uh, bud break. Um, I'll try and get some pictures up onto our website and uh, post it through our social media channel so you guys can see the, the progression. But um, what bud break is is the the buds that spend uh, uh, they start developing in the previous growing season. They overwinter on the cane, and then as the warm weather and the moisture starts to flow within the grapevines themselves, the buds swell up, and eventually they break through that little uh, encasement that, that's, that's covering them. And uh, inside that is all the future growth of a shoot, including leaves, stems, tendrils, and grape clusters. So uh, we really don't want the cutworms to get those things. Um, our Merlot block is uh, fairly well into that process. The Pinot Blanc started uh, about three days ago um, with, uh, I'd say, probably about two-thirds of the Pinot Blanc having uh, broken already. And uh, Bacchus, which is the, the third grape we have on our Conviction Ridge Vineyard, is a little bit slower to, to break. Um, it's starting to in, in some of the warmer spots of the vineyard, and over the next week or so we should be fully into that one. Okay. Um, one question we had uh, last week that came in just as we were signing off uh, from Vanessa, I thought I would address that uh, this week, and the question was uh, about the difference between corks and screw caps and how we decide what goes uh, onto each of our, our different wines. There, there's really no, um, no, no specific reason or answer to that question. A lot of it is, is preference of the winemaker. Uh, the, the, the technology behind screw caps these days is, is actually quite advanced. The reason originally that, uh, that you would use cork uh, over screw cap is that you want some uh, small trace amounts of oxygen to get into the bottle. So if you look, uh, here's a picture of the cork inside the bottle. Uh, cork is a natural material and it's naturally porous. When you, when you put a cork into the bottle, it's compressed quite hard to fit into the, uh, into the, the neck and then it expands. Um, as it expands, it, it sort of puts that pressure on the outside of the neck and seals it, but it doesn't seal it 100%. It, it seals it generally to a, to a point where the liquid can't escape through the, the microscopic pores, but oxygen can. So what happens is you get a little bit of oxygen uh, in this little head space here that in most bottles is about, uh, I don't know, a centimeter or less. And that helps to to age the wine slowly over time. Uh, the oxygen helps to slowly oxidize the wine and break down uh, components like tannins and stuff like that. With a screw cap, generally speaking, uh, we've got one, one here. Generally speaking, uh, the, the screw caps are designed to not allow that oxygen to enter into the bottle. Uh, there are some uh, liners, so next time you open a bottle with a screw cap, uh, look up on the inside and you'll see, in most cases, it's a silver or a white liner that's got a round indentation on it. When the, when the caps are uh, put onto the bottles during the bottling process, they're compressed and then they're, they're spun on to get the threads. When you make that compression, that's what's making the seal. If, uh, if you have a liner that allows a little bit of oxygen permeability, then you can simulate a cork um, in a, maybe in a slightly more controlled way. Uh, so, so that is one, uh, one advancement in the, uh, in the space of closures where you can now use a screw cap to simulate and get the same sort of effects as, uh, as the cork, but with uh, theoretically less spoilage because it's not a natural material like the corks are. Uh, I choose to use corks for most of our red wines and uh, some of the white wines that we hand bottle. 
for our other white wines, generally those are those are done in a street cut. Hopefully, that, oh. One yeah. comment just came in from Andrea. Corks feel fancy. Corks do feel fancy. Um, are, are they fancy? I don't know if, if that's actually true, but there, there's definitely some ceremony that goes around with opening a bottle, especially if you're at a restaurant and you've ordered a really expensive bottle of wine. Um, there's no pomp and circumstance around simply twisting off a cap. So, uh, so from that perspective, there's definitely tradition behind it that, uh, that is definitely um, sort of enhanced the, the, the classiness of it. Um, but from a, from a winemaking perspective, uh, both closures are, are, are effective and uh, really it comes down to preference. Great. Okay, let's get into uh, a discussion about Pinot Noir. Uh, if you are familiar with this grape, um, it, it's one of the, it's a fairly ubiquitous grape around the world. I think the top five nations for production would be uh, France, and in particular the, the Burgundy region. That's kind of the, the hotbed and the, and the homeland of Pinot Noir as, as the grape itself, and it's where some of the world's best Pinot Noirs come from. Uh, the second on that list would be the United States. Uh, most, most of the production of Pinot Noir is in California and Oregon. Um, and then third would be Germany, and the grape's actually called Spatbergunder. Uh, so most people think of uh, Germany for their, their sweeter white wines, but uh, there's, there's all, all kinds of wines and styles that come out of Germany, and uh, their Pinot Noir is actually quite, uh, quite good. Fourth on the list was a shock for me, and that's Moldova. Uh, I can honestly say I've never had a wine from Moldova, but after uh, reading about it, I definitely want to try it. Um, there's, uh, it it's, it's a fairly significant uh, country in terms of wine production. Um, it's, uh, it borders the Black Sea near Ukraine and Romania, I think. So uh, not a region that uh, we tend to find in our market here, but uh, probably worth uh, seeking out, especially for their Pinot Noir. And then fifth is Italy, where the grape is called Pinot Nero. Um, in, uh, in Canada, BC in particular, uh, just because of our size, we never rank anywhere near the top of, uh, of any list for total production. But uh, Pinot Noir is actually a stellar grape for our climate. Um, if, if people were to, to throw around the, the, the signature varietal moniker, which I don't like to do, but if you were to look at a few different grapes that really, really thrive in, in, this, uh, in this region, Pinot Noir is probably on the top of the list for red wines. Um, I believe Syrah's on that as well, but uh, the, the thing about the Pinot Noir is it, it really uh, has found a home from the north, the, the northernmost regions of, of where we're producing wines in BC, which is even further north than the Okanagan, uh, all the way down to the Soyuz. Um, what's interesting though is, is how those different uh, regions will, will manifest themselves into the finished wines. If you think about uh, more of the northern regions, the northern half of the Okanagan and, and then the Thompson uh, Schuswap area, those wines, because they're, there's more granite in the soil, they tend to be more elegant, more ethereal in their, in their character, maybe a little bit lighter, um, truly beautiful wines. And if you were to look at Pinot Noirs from further south where it's slightly warmer and your soils are a bit more silty, uh, those wines tend to be more concentrated and slightly fuller body. One is not better than the other. It just depends on the style you, uh, you, you prefer. And, uh, and it's just great to know that that's a, a varietal that can definitely span the entire uh, region of our valley here. Um, one other thing that I'd maybe talk about uh, before we get into the specifics of this wine would be just some general stylistic uh, components to Pinot Noir. Um, generally, it's, it's a lighter to a medium bodied wine. Um, you're going to have predominantly red fruit flavors. Uh, there's, in some expressions of Pinot Noir, there's a, there's a floral tone to it as well. Uh, and then for most Pinot Noirs, particularly the older world style, there's a, there's a dirtiness to it, there's an earthiness, and I mean that in a good way, not in a bad way. Uh, there's, a, there's, there's this real sort of um, uh, musty character, forest floor mushroom that is really, really unique to Pinot Noir, and it really manifests itself well in this, in this lighter style of wine. Uh, and then one other thing, so we grow at our property here, we grow Pinot Blanc. Uh, Pinot Gris, I believe, is the most widely planted, or one of the most widely planted white varietals in the Okanagan. But uh, Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, and Pinot Blanc are all just mutations of the same variety. And that's, uh, that's a, a uni uniqueness that, uh, that is, surrounds this particular grape. 
Uh, and there are cases where, um, where the vines will just spontaneously mutate uh, at some point in your life and you think you're going to have Pinot Noir and you end up with Pinot Gris. If you think you have Pinot Gris, you might end up with some plants with, uh, with white grapes. So it's, uh, it's truly an interesting varietal. The growing conditions for Pinot Noir. They're, uh, if you've ever heard the expression, the heartbreak grape, uh, they're talking about Pinot Noir. And it is definitely a challenging varietal to work with. Uh, but for, for many people, many winemakers, the, the, the results are definitely worth all that work that goes into it. It's a tough grape to grow. Uh, and it, it's, it's a very, uh, uh, this varietal is very reflective of, of its site, of its terroir. Uh, because it's a lighter style of wine, it really shows uh, its, its location. So, you know, its climate, the type of soil it's in, the style of, uh, of the winemaking itself, it really shows that off beautifully. And there's not a whole lot to mask behind in Pinot Noir. Um, it likes moderate climates, generally speaking, um, and it likes a long, cool growing season. So the, the best places for Pinot Noir, you'll find, and if you were to look around the world where Pinot Noir is really, really uh, um, successful, they're in protected valleys or close to significant sizes of, uh, of uh, water, lakes or oceans. So if you're looking at the Okanagan, we've got uh, Okanagan Lake, we've got Skaha Lake. Uh, if you think about, um, well, uh, Burgundy, uh, that's a fairly long and narrow valley that all those grapes are grown in. And then California, like Sonoma Coast, Central Coast, all of those, uh, those, those warmer regions are actually moderated by the cool influences from the ocean. So those, uh, those locations for Pinot Noir are, are, are pretty important in terms of defining its, its ultimate style. They also prefer east-facing slopes. Uh, when, you, when you think of red wines, particularly your bigger Bordeaux style or your, your Rome varietals, those ones really thrive in west-facing slopes, so they get that hot afternoon sun. With Pinot Noir, it's kind of the opposite, um, and there's a few reasons for that. First is that the, the clusters for Pinot Noir tend to be small and quite dense and, and tight. Uh, and the reason that an east slope is important for that is, uh, particularly in the ripening period and the, and the uh, sort of the, the pre-harvest period where you're You've got cool nights, uh, maybe some dew uh, or condensation overnight. If, uh, if that condensation stays inside those bunches, uh, you, you run a really high risk of getting botrytis bunch rot, which is, uh, can be devastating for your, your crop. And so what the morning sun does is it can actually sort of burn off that dew and that condensation and dry those clusters out. The other reason is that uh, Pinot Noir is a very thin-skinned grape. And so that really, really hot blazing afternoon sun that you would have on a western exposure, uh, in many cases, is, is a bit too intense for, for this delicate grape. So that's kind of why east-facing slopes tend to have uh, you know, more, more elegant expressions of Pinot Noir than, than you would find on, on a western slope. And as I already mentioned, uh, one of the big reasons this is called a heartbreak grape is because of those challenges during the growing season and its susceptibility to, to infections like, like bunch rot. Uh, so, uh, it truly is a, a wine that is, is made in, in many cases in the vineyard. Um, you need to have a, a really good farmer that understands the, the weather and the impacts on this particular varietal and that they take all the necessary decisions and steps throughout that growing season to maintain the health of those bunches. Uh, so that's kind of uh, what makes Pinot Noir the heartbreak grape and uh, why we probably all love it so much. Comment coming in from OPG Vineyard. Okay. Funny you mention mutation. We've seen on our vineyard a couple of our Pinot Gris turn into Pinot Blanc and two vines into Pinot Noir. Yeah, that is, that is classic because it's essentially the same varietal. It's not, there's not a lot of genetic differences between them. So uh, it has, has happened. Uh, we have in our, in our block of Pinot Blanc, we actually have about 10% Pinot Gris. Now, we didn't plant this vineyard ourselves, so we don't know if it was intentionally done that way or if those plants mutated in, in the early stages of their, of their life, but uh, we definitely have uh, about 5-10% uh, Pinot Gris plants in our block. Okay, let's, uh, let's get into the winemaking of this one. Um, this was harvested October 5th of uh, 2017. Uh, if you recall from uh, any of our previous uh, uh, virtual tastings where we talked about that growing season, it was uh, relatively moderate in its temperature because of a lot of the atmospheric smoke. 
which was actually pretty good for Pinot Noir because it, it shielded some of that blazing sun. The vineyard where we get our Pinot Noir from uh, is, uh, is actually in North Oliver. So it's a South Okanagan vineyard, it, but it's a lighter style because it's, uh, it's kind of tucked into the, the northwest corner of the valley. So it has that southeastern exposure and it's beautifully sloped vineyard, uh, great, great place for Pinot Noir. And it uh, was farmed by friends of ours, Robin and Will Carlson, who, uh, who actually, 2017 was the last year they farmed that property. So um, it's great to know the people that are, are growing our fruit and uh, they, uh, they produce beautiful Pinot Noir. We hand pick and we hand sort all of our grapes. Uh, Pinot Noir is no different. So when the fruit comes into the, into the winery, uh, although it's already been sorted and, uh, and, and, and had some level of screen as the fruit's picked into the bins, we do a second sorting just to make sure that only the best clusters get into our batches. And then we, we de-stemmed our Pinot Noir, but we didn't do a crush. And so uh, the, the theory here is that the whole berry fermentation, um, it helps to prevent a little bit of oxidation. Um, when, when the berries get cracked, uh, the, the juice is quite delicate and really susceptible to, uh, to oxidation. Um, now, the berries will get cracked just by virtue of the weight in the fermentation vat. Uh, so to say that they're, they're going to stay whole for the, the whole period of fermentation is not, not actually correct, but we don't uh, precipitate that process. We let that happen naturally as the, uh, as the grapes are soaking. We did a one day cold soak. Again, with this style of wine that we're looking for, we weren't trying to get a lot of extraction. Uh, Pinot Noir generally doesn't throw off a lot of color and a lot of tannins. Uh, if you want that style, then you would perhaps do uh, a longer maceration to get more of those components out of the skins and the seeds. Uh, and also, if you were looking for more of a, a more tannic expression of Pinot Noir, you would probably consider doing a whole cluster fermentation, which would be including the stems, because some tannins will come out and some structure will come out from the, uh, the, the stems themselves during fermentation. Now, for our, for our, for our, our alcoholic fermentation, we did a two-stage fermentation on this wine. Uh, it was the first year that we started working with some products that uh, we're really excited about. Um, we started our fermentation with a non-saccharomyces yeast strain. And what that is, is essentially the same strains that you would get in a wild fermentation. So if you were to bring grapes in from the field and just let the fermentation take over naturally, uh, it's a non-saccharomyces yeast strain that is generally going to kick off that fermentation. Um, we're doing that same process, but just in a slightly more controlled way by using a commercialized non-saccharomyces yeast strain. And then we follow that up with, uh, with a normal inoculation. Really happy with the results because it brings in sort of that gaininess that, uh, that you get from the wild fermentations, which is really, really nicely uh, um, manifested in the Pinot Noir. We just did it in a slightly more controlled way. The wine spent a total of 20 days on skins, um, and again with Pinot Noir, uh, that may sound like a lot, but to, to get a lot of color and to lot of structure, you need a fair bit of, uh, of uh, skin contact time. So we, uh, we limited it to, to just under three weeks. Once fermentation was done, we put our wine into barrels. Uh, for Pinot Noir, we use exclusively French oak, and we're trying to keep a soft oak touch on this wine, so we didn't use any new barrels. We used second fill and neutral barrels for our Pinot Noir. And they, uh, they sat there for 21 months before we pulled them out, uh, made the blend of the different barrels, and then bottled it in December of 2019. So this is relatively uh, recently bottled, um, definitely showing nicely now, but will still continue to age. And the other thing I want to say about this, uh, this wine is that we bottled it unfined and unfiltered. Uh, we're particularly with our unsanctioned series and then the Pinot Noir as well, uh, where we're looking for as, as uh, natural of a style of winemaking and as low intervention as possible. Filtering and, and fining. So fining is a way to stabilize the wine for proteins. And, and it's, it's done in, in a number of ways. You can fine with egg whites, you can fine with, uh, with um, uh, gelatin. Basically what those do is they, they bind to the proteins and they take out uh, things that will precipitate out of the wine over time. And, uh, and filtering does sort of the same thing. And so we, we decided to, to let that stay in the bottle, which is a perfectly normal thing to do. Um, but over time, you will start to see likely some sediment settling at the bottom of this bottle. Um, and it, uh, again, the, the whole philosophy behind that is, is 
it's one less intervention step that can potentially take away something. Every time you, you, you get into the way, into the process, when you take something out of the wine, you're potentially reducing character, reducing flavor, all those things. So uh, with these uh, smaller batch wines, we like to, to do it as uh, little intervention as possible. Questions coming in right now. Does it affect the quality of the wine with the sediment at the bottom? Absolutely not. In, in fact, uh, from my perspective, seeing sediment in a bottle is a good thing and it, it shows uh, usually a concerted effort by the winemaker to not detract and to maintain all those flavor components and, and structure components in the wine. It might be visually unappealing to some people. Um, so if, if your preference is to not have to um, either decant your wine or, or leave that last little centimeter in the bottle, um, then you know perhaps look for wines that are filtered or fined. Um, and you'll also find in even in white wines, uh, we generally filter our white wines, but in some cases we don't do cold stabilization. Um, and so you can get uh, what are called tartrate crystals, and those will precipitate out into the bottom of the bottle. And they look, I think they've been called wine diamonds or, or uh, glass shards or something. They're just little crystalline structures that are, are um, uh, part of a chemical reaction that goes on as the, as the wine ages. Perfectly safe to, to consume. Um, you just need to get over that sort of visual appeal. And from my perspective, seeing those sort of natural processes uh, evolving in the bottle uh, is a good thing for, 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 for me. Okay, um, we're going to taste this. I'm going to open it right now and uh, get it airing out. Uh, again, we have our wax doll up on top of this one. Uh, this is an unfiltered bottle, so if it was a little bit older, I probably wouldn't get too aggressive with warming up the wax. But because it was just bottled a few months ago, there's, uh, there's no sediment falling out of it yet. So I'm just going to warm up that wax. And put the cork screwed right through the top. And as we let this open up a little bit, we're going to talk about uh, wine aromas and how you can train your nose to detect some of these things. For Pinot Noir, uh, I'll just say this right now as we're getting into the discussion on aroma. Generally, uh, you're going to want to have a relatively wide, bold glass with a closed top to contain the aromas because it's a delicate, uh, a delicate wine. If it was an open style of glass, those things would just escape right out of the glass. And in this case, you want to try and contain them a little bit. Okay, wine aromas. This is uh, a kit that I bought years ago as I was uh, on, on my, uh, my winemaking and, and small age journey. Uh, it's called the Nasavan. And this is a series of vials that in this case, this set has 54 different aromatic compounds. And, and these are ones that are, are most commonly found in, in all types of wine. And so what you do is you essentially, you can use these kits to train uh, your nose to detect them. Um, this is quite an expensive piece of, uh, of equipment that uh, not everyone should or needs to invest in. So you can make these yourself. And that's what we're gonna do tonight. Um, there's, there's, there's a lot of resources available on the website to, uh, sorry, on, on the internet to guide you into how to make all these things. I've picked five different, uh, compounds that will hopefully show up somewhere in our Pinot Noir we're tasting tonight, just to give you an illustration of how easy it is to actually make these yourselves. So what you want to do is, uh, grab your, your, your aromatic component you're trying to, to train yourself on. Uh, the first one I'm going to do here is cherries. So I've just got some, I bought frozen cherries uh, because they actually macerate a little bit better. And they're just sitting in some of their juices that have come out. And I added a cherry and a little bit of that juice to a glass of wine. Uh, you usually want to do about an ounce or two, not a whole lot. Uh, and important to note, when you're, when you're using uh, a wine to, to, to do these aromatic uh, training sessions, don't, don't use a really good wine, I shouldn't say that, that's kind of mean, but you want to use a wine that's neutral and kind of bland, that's not overly oaky, not overly extracted, just kind of bland and, and, and neutral, so that you can pull out the specific uh, aromatic component you're trying to, to, to learn about. Um, so I just use a fairly generic wine here, but in this case, uh, this is cherries, 
And all you're doing is you're, you're, you're letting that one component get intensified. Uh, and the, uh, the, the components, the aromatics that you're smelling, they're, they're volatized by the alcohol, which makes it a bit easier to, to smell. Uh, in the case of fruit, you, know, you can just smell this in, in, the, in the container here, and it's, it's actually quite vibrant. But when you get into some of the more nuanced uh, uh, aromatics, like some of the, the, the spices and the, and the oak type tones, they don't necessarily jump out on their own, which is why it's better to put them into a glass. So this one's cherry. We have raspberries. Again, these are the two red fruits that are pretty dominant in Pinot Noir. So I've got crushed up raspberries, and that smells exactly like raspberries. Now, for the earthiness, let's look at uh, getting some mushroom notes. So we've got some dried morels here. I've just crushed a couple of them up. So we just throw some of them into the glass here. And ideally, you want to let these things uh, soak and integrate for a little bit, but just to show you how easy it is to do it, you simply add the mushrooms and try and pull out that, that component. Now, smell it on its own, and that's definitely a, a really gamey, earthy mushroom smell. And uh, I'm starting to get it on this, but I think if we let this sit for another half hour or so, we would definitely start to pull that out. Uh, another spice that is uh, often found in, in a lot of wines, but in Pinot Noir, would be like a baking spice like nutmeg. So really intense on its own. So let's try and uh, mute that a little bit and get those uh, aromatic compounds volatized a bit. So throw some into the wine. Close this up so it stops smelling that. Yeah, and then, okay, you definitely can start to pull out some of the baking spices. That makes a pretty pungent uh, uh, spice. Um, so you could experiment with things like cinnamon and cloves and a whole bunch of different things. But um, spices really work well in this type of a, of a intestine system. And then last, let's look at some dirt. So I walked out into our vineyard and grabbed a, a handful of dirt. Let's see if we can get some of that earthiness into our glass here. It kind of smells like mud. And so there you have it. So this is just five very simple uh, aromatic compounds that you can build on your own. You can do them dry. Uh, I think it's better if you actually put them into a little bit of wine. Um, let them sit. Uh, seal them up for, for an hour or, or three or four. Uh, and then have yourself a glass of wine that you're, you're looking to sort of uh, uh, get your, your nose into. Sniff the, the wine without any, uh, any of those components in it. And then try and work your way through, identify, recognize the smell from your samples, and then try and pull them out of the wine itself. All right, let's get into the tasting of our Pinot Noir. So if you look at the color on this, this is... Uh, Definitely got a fruit fly here. Uh, it's a lighter body wine. You can see it's fairly pale in its color. Um, brickish red almost, uh, raspberry colorish. Uh, it's actually quite clear. There's no haze in this wine at all. But as we're talking about the, the unfine, unfiltered things, that, that will change over time as this wine settles and some of the, uh, the, the phenol components precipitate out of that wine. It might start to become a little bit more cloudy, but that's totally fine. It's just uh, depends on, uh, on the age of the wine and how much that will show. Now, if we think about what we're going to find in this, so generally speaking, Pinot Noir is led by red fruits. So think of cherries, raspberries as the two hallmark uh, fruits. Sometimes you'll find some strawberry notes, but generally it's, uh, it's uh, cherries and, and uh, raspberries. Now ours has, I would say, uh, it's got a savory note to it for sure, which is likely a, a mushroom type smell. And then there's, uh, there's, there's like a, an autumn leaf, a dried leaf, uh, not a wet leaf, but a dry, like if you pick up uh, some, some leaves off a tree in the fall and crunch them in your hand, you get that, that sort of fresh, crunchy brown smell, which is, uh, which is quite alluring. And then 
Uh, let's give this a taste. So yeah, the, the body, definitely light to medium body. The tannins are, 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 are what I would call dusty. So they're, they're soft, they're not grippy. You feel them, but there's a, there's a, a nice lifted acidity, acidity to this wine, which sort of instantly refreshes the drying sensation from the tannins and your mouth starts to water. Um, and it carries all the way through to the mid palate. On, on the, from a flavor perspective, I'd say definitely the, the, the cherry, the raspberry, I'm, I'm definitely getting that mushroom. I would even say there's a little bit of tobacco and leather. So again, more on the savory side, uh, as soon as that fruit diminishes, you get that wonderful savory side of the Pinot Noir. I even say milk chocolate. That's, that's what I'm, I'm going with, I'm gonna to stick to it. So you've got a question coming in, would you recommend your Pinot Noir for game meat? Uh, yes, well that's, that's a good segue into talking about some food pairing. So, uh, Pinot Noir, for red wines is probably one of the most versatile wines. Uh, last week I talked about rosé being sort of universally uh, great for food. If you're thinking about red wine, Pinot Noir is actually quite flexible for, for a couple of reasons. Um, the first would be there's, there's a really wide range of Pinot Noirs made from the, that lighter elegant style to the full bodied sort of uh, more structured side. So depending on the type of food you're having, there's likely a Pinot Noir that can fit the bill for that. Uh, as far as game goes, absolutely. Uh, I think because there's savory notes to this wine, uh, it would definitely match well with game, with duck, with uh, pheasant, quail, all those sort of more gamey style birds. Um, maybe your, your really rich gamey red meats might be a bit too uh, overpowering for, for our style of Pinot Noir, but you could most definitely find a fuller body style of Pinot Noir that would go with those. Chicken, pork, all fantastic uh, fish like salmon. Um, really, really nice with Pinot Noir. Uh, our, our recipe that we just put up on our website that you guys should check out is uh, it kind of draws on that savory note and the mushroom component. They're, they're crostini with, uh, with mushrooms, prosciutto, and uh, a conte cheese. It's more of a canapé appetizer style thing, but it's uh, really, really good. If you guys can check that recipe out um, and try it with this, this Pinot Noir, you'll love it. Uh, on that note, actually, uh, the recipes for the pairings that we're doing with our tastings are up on the website. Uh, if you were to go into our, our online store, each individual wine where we list the, the wine making stats and the, the, the characteristics of the wine, all that stuff, there is a link under the food pairing section now that will take you to a PDF of our recipes for our recommended pairings. So um, check those out for sure. Pinot Noir is up there, as is the one from last week's America. Okay, uh, do we have any questions? Someone's asking, uh, Stefan was asking, are you a little surprised with the light col coloring of the wine given it spent 21 days on the skins? No, not, not at all actually. As I was saying before, Pinot Noir doesn't have a whole lot of anthocyanins in their skin, so it takes a lot of work and a lot of time to extract those. Uh, the style of winemaking that I employed for this uh, was more focused around flavor and not trying to extract a whole bunch of color and body. So 20 days for Pinot Noir is not a lot um, for, for a wine with, uh, with this sort of hue. You commented on a fruit fly. Uh, the rest of Canada would like you to know that most of the fruit flies are still frozen. Yeah. <laughs> fruit flies are the bane of our existence in the wine world. So uh, uh, it's, it's nice to have warm weather, but it's not nice having them back. Do you feel there's really a uh, an importance of difference for using different brimmed wine glasses for different wines or is a generic white wine glass fine for whites and a generic red glass fine for reds? Uh, that's I, I'm a believer that, that some of the specific glasses are actually quite effective um, but try it yourself if, if you ever have a question about you know is Pinot Noir better in a bowl like this or in the tulip style uh, get your hand on a couple of those glasses and, and, and try it and you'll you'll see certain varietals I think are maybe a bit more um, uh, enhanced by the particular glass or the specific glass than others but uh, give it a try there's only one way to find out and that's to uh, experience that for yourself. Brett wants to know how long do you think uh, this Pinot Noir can lay down for? 
I'd say probably five years would be great. Um, again, this is a this is a lighter, fresher style of Pinot Noir. So uh, this one I, I would say is not uh, a wine that I would destine for long term cellar aging. I would tend to leave that for our, our more our, our fuller body reds, the Bordeaux styles and the Syrah. Uh, this one is definitely really really nice now. Um, right out of the bottle, I would let it maybe aerate in your glass for a little bit before drinking it, but uh, a couple years in the cellar for sure. Angela is asking, is there much variance in taste profile each year between the Pinot Noirs? There is. Uh, so let's go back to the discussion we had about how, how uh, influenced the Pinot Noir grapes are by their environment. They are very reflective of things like, like temperature and heat. So uh, each vintage is going to have a very, very significant impact on the ultimate style of that wine. Um, we don't make Pinot Noir every year as a red wine. Um, our, we did 2015 and 2017 for our recent vintages uh, and very different wines. Our 2015 came from a really hot year. That was a much fuller bodied style of Pinot Noir. Uh, 2017 being slightly cooler and, and that um, moderated effect from the, the atmospheric smoke definitely helped to bring out the more elegant style of Pinot Noir that we, uh, we got from a, a Southern Okanagan. Do you find a certain type of grape more difficult to bring to your expectations? No, every grape definitely has its uh, its challenges, uh, and as you as you get experience with uh, with with different grapes, and particularly with those those grapes from the same vineyards year in year out, you start to learn the nuances of them. Um, you know, Pinot Noir is a challenging grape to work with no matter what, but it's uh, it, it's nice to know uh, where it's grown and how it's grown, and uh, it definitely is important for Pinot Noir. Uh, Sam is asking uh, if we have any merch for sale yet. T-shirts, bumper stickers perhaps, hats? <laughs> We're still working on that. Uh, these cowboys are kind of getting away with a lot of other things from happening around here. Uh, merchandise uh, getting ordered is one of them, as is some of our uh, our uh, one on one uh, live virtual tastings with uh, with some of our customers. If you're interested in those, by the way, just reach out to us. We will get merch up in the next few weeks. It's just a matter of uh, of getting all the vendors stuff behind us and having a bit more time to focus. We're good for questions. All right. Uh, let me just sign off by saying. Um, we only have 14 cases of our Pinot Noir left. Uh, this wine, we only produced 55 cases of it, and it is only available uh, from us directly at the winery. Uh, our unsanctioned series wines generally never see uh, store shelves or restaurant uh, menus. Um, so if you want to grab some of this last uh, remaining cases, I would do it sooner rather than later. Next week, okay, a little closer. This is our Pinot Blanc. And what's special about this, other than it's the wine that uh, we love, uh, it was the first vintage we've made from our vineyard here in Colleen, Conviction Ridge. So uh, next week we'll talk about um, what makes this particular wine unique. Uh, Pinot Blanc, I think in many cases, is an underrated grape. It doesn't get the same sort of stature that, it, that Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Gris get from the valley here. But it's a beautiful wine that's uh, um, capable of many different expressions. Ours, we did uh, fermentations and aging in neutral oak barrels. So it's a pretty unique wine for Pinot Blanc. And I can't wait to show it with you guys next week. Uh, sorry, just a couple more questions. Last okay. minute questions coming in. Gabriel's asking, forget stickers. Will you ship us wine? We're not in BC. Yes, we ship wine everywhere in Canada. And in fact, we've had uh, two orders uh, in the past week to Nunavut, which is the first time we've ever shipped up there. So we, uh, we send wine to all territories and provinces in Canada. And someone's asking if we ship to the U.S. We, the, uh, well, we ship merchandise to the U.S. Yeah, we ship merchandise to the U.S. Uh, we're still trying to figure out a way to get our wines into the States. Um, there's, uh, there's demand for our product down there. In particular, a, a white wine we have called Collusion. It seems to be a bit of a hot word down there these days. Um, so we would love to get our wines down there. We're, we're working on it. It's kind of in our longer term plan for, for this year uh, to get wines at least into the Washington area. But uh, stay, stay tuned for that. I'll just note too, but we do offer free shipping across all provinces in Canada. Uh, it's not quite free up north, but uh, reach out and we can talk to you about that. Nick is asking if your wife, your wife really loves you, shouldn't she buy you a case of your favorite black market wine? <laughs> 
She should, actually. <laughs> Great. Okay, thanks everybody. Uh, hope you guys had fun tonight. Hope you learned something. And uh, don't be shy about trying some of these experiments that we're going through in these tastings. And uh, wine's all about learning and experiencing, so get out there and experience. See you guys next week.